All right, let's do it. So to start with, you need to make sure that you have quad IO set to zero. And anytime you're in here, you normally would just make sure this is set automatically from your environment variables or other things like that. But make sure that this is set. And if you see weird output, make sure that this is set. Because quad IO is an old historical aspect of APL where you can set the index origin. So that means you count by zero or you count by one, or starting at one or zero. And since we're all computer-ish people, then we're going to count by zero. And that's how that's going to go. So then we're going to just type in some numbers. So IOTA generates indices. So we can generate the nine natural numbers. And everybody just follow along with this, typing this stuff in and, and work through that. Why does mine start with one? Precisely because of what I just said in quad IO. Did you do the get quad IO get zero? Did you do the first line quad IO get zero? Left arrow or right arrow? No, you did squad. There are two quads, squad and quad. Squad is skinny quad. You want the quad, which is the wider quad. Yeah. The L key. Didn't that give you an error? No, because it's a monadic squad is. Um, okay. I don't <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, no, this is just a, a guidance. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a strict, it's, I think the dash O is actually like option. You have to use the appropriate um, flags. I think it's like option. Yeah. Because every time you change or align, it'll cue it to be executed. Okay, but I did a clear. That didn't no, clear won't do any of that. It still tracks your stuff. So if you hit enter right here. Yeah, you're fine. And now you type something in. Yeah, but I wanted to erase all that. And I guess I can't do that. Oh, no, no, no. You just hit enter a bunch of times. <laughs> um, the session is almost always saved. So very often in, in APL programming, people will track their session over time and, keep, and maintain it in their, their work history. You can, you can erase your session history and restart your thing, but that's kind of weird. Um, I've never had to clear that out. There is actually some funny little salt thing. We, we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that. Right, right now you can think of this as, a, are any of you familiar with Smalltalk? This is a REPL that saves state across multiple executions. So a workspace is like a binary memory dump of your machine that you continue, uh, well, it's a, it's a sort of like a memory dump or an image dump that you can then reload whenever you want and preserves the bound variables in your state. And you keep working with it like that. Like sort of like an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, the, the, there is ways to get source code in and out of that, but we'll, we'll discuss that. For the most part, right now, we're just going to work straight in the session. So is everybody able to get IOTA 9? Oh, yeah. Basically, there are two languages you want to set up. And then you need the US plain variant, or whatever your particular language is, and then the dialogue variant of the APL keyboard. So I, I, I think it's. Layout, that's the right one. Something like that. Yes. The input method on which platform? In Linux? So in Linux, then, once you've run this command, when you're in your Windows session, you should be able to hit the left alt key and press various keys and get funny symbols out. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you want to get the full-blown experience, you can install and use the APL 385 font that's in the dialog package. Uh, that's inside of that opt folder, the M dialog folder. You can you get the font, and you'll see the font looks like this, and uh, that's a little nicer to program in. But you should have fallback fonts already on Linux working. So. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, I don't know if there's a, yeah, so then let's move over again. All right. So after we get the first natural numbers, we can turn this into a matrix. So right now we're going to be working entirely, or for the most part, over uh, rectangular n-dimensional arrays. Largely over numeric arrays, but also plenty of character arrays. So this takes those first uh, nine natural numbers and converts it to a three by three matrix. So we have reshape here and iota here. So everything, when you read these things, parentheses have precedence, and then we execute from right to left. So if you want to know how something is executing as an expression, read it from right to left. That's the execution order. There's no other order precedence for plain first order functions in APL. That's how it goes straight through. The, um, so like things like plus and times have the same precedence in APL. Did you, did yours show up all right? Yeah, yours is working good. Okay. Yes, you can use try APL, that's fine. And then you can use the keyboard. Quad IO1. That's the, the one right above the IO9. You're welcome to get uh, to pull up the chair right up front if you want. Yeah. yeah. You're welcome. Like if you if you need to be closer to see the whole thing, feel free. Yeah. Uh, row is a binary and a monadic function. In its monadic shape, it will return to us the shape. In its dyadic form, it will return the reshape of the array on its right. Two times two plus, because of the precedence order. Everything is right to left. What was the command you running? So then that is this, like that. Order of evaluation is always right to left. Precedence is right to left. Star is exponentiation. Yeah. So how, how does the three space three row uh, evaluate? Three space three. Yes. Yeah, so three three row something on the right will take whatever is on the right and fill a three by three matrix with the contents of what is on the right in row major order, read in row major order from the right side. But so is this three space. It's the left argument. So all functions appear in fix in APL. Yeah. It's the of the, the yeah. Why do you get that? Oh, why do I get this? This is considered a literal, so it's an atomic value in APL. So this would get like that. Ah, so yeah, the <laughs> space is a function. Space. Is a function. Okay. Kind of works a little like that. Well, right. So the the space is 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 going like this. so. It's it's space is a higher precedence order because it's the the literal notation. It's part of the atomic syntax, not part of uh, the expression syntax of evaluating function application. Yeah. So this would be considered a literal on the left hand side. And you'll notice that when we refill, it fills modulo. Yeah. OK. And so then we can take the three row, three by three row, nine. And we can ask which of those are one, two, three, four, and seven. And we get a Boolean matrix. So you guys should all type that in and make sure it works for you, see what you're going through. And Morton, you're welcome to go around and make sure everybody's got questions. Yeah. And if something is not showing up, let me know or let Morton know so we can take a look I want at to it. Make sure they're actually doing this yes, I want to make sure they're actually typing that in. Else? Yes. <laughs> We've got to make them work. <laughs> Membership is under E, I believe. Row is R on the keyboard when you type it in for the Linux guys. And IOTA is under I on the keyboard. So. Yeah. 
So is it all going all right? I've given up on using try APL. Okay, yeah. So if, if you want to run through the walkthrough to start with, you can use tryapl.org to evaluate some stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah. One, two, three, four, seven. Yeah. Yeah. Two, three, four, seven. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was another card. Great. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, you're all set. Yeah. Is there a way for people to access that document without yes. Uh, I was going to put a PDF of it out there. Uh, yeah. I, I, I can try to send out some PDFs into the shared folder. Uh, even online? Because you should be able to just click the link and it should pull you to a web page. Okay. I think I can print. Can I print the whole? You were able to open? Yeah. Online may be better for copy pasting. I think copy pasting from PDF is. Yeah, if you can do it online, you'll be able to copy and paste from the stuff a little easier. But. Yeah, so I could, I can, I can print some PDFs if, if you need. Um, let's. Oh, you did? All right, so Slack, you should have a PDF of it posted now. So, yeah. Okay. So everybody was able to get their little Boolean matrix showing up? Anybody still working on that? Nobody? You got to let me know. <laughs> yeah, you're good? Okay. All right, so now we're going to store that. Like so. And now R, and so this is how we create names or bindings in the language with this left arrow. So we read this as saying R gets the 3 by 3 reshape shape of iota 9 quantity as a member of 1, 2, 3, 4, 7. And then we can do an overtake of this to get a larger array padded on the right and down with zeros. Yes? Quad IO is a system variable. So it's a, it's a variable that's used in the system. So quad is used to designate the system namespace for, for accessing some of those variables. So did you, were you able to run it? Yeah. Oh, oh. Okay, cool. No problem. All right. Good to go? Working? All right. So now what we can do is we can do the neg2 rotate around which axis? Can you guys guess which axis this is rotating around? Yeah. <laughs> That's a high minus with two. So high minus is your uh, on the two key. Yeah, on the two key. So there is the negate function, okay. which negates things. High minus is part of the literal syntax for uh, negative numbers. So in APL, they distinguish between a neg 2 and a high minus 2. So, or a, a negative 2 and a neg 2. So we would read this neg 2 rotate, etc. And so the neg 2 is a single atomic unit, whereas minus the, the minus symbol is a monadic or a dyadic function, which is a function that takes either one argument or two arguments. So um, if to see the difference here, we get this. Can anybody guess what that's going to give us? Yeah. V is... Uh, yeah, your 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 prefix or what your your mode shift, right? your mode shift shift in five. Yeah. Yeah. So why did this happen? Yeah. So so this is parsed differently than up above because high minus is not a function. It's part of your numerical syntax. So that's an atomic. And that's the left argument. 
So the phi is a rotate. It's not a phi. It's a rotate. It's a rotate along the vertical axis. So in this case, we have everything to the right of the phi, or the rotate, is a 5, 7 over take r, or take r. That gives us our original matrix, which we see above there. And then we rotate that along the vertical axis by whatever's on the left. In the second example, we rotate it by 2, so it shifts to the left. In the example above that, we're shifting it neg 2, so we're shifting it 2 to the right. But in the second one, we have an additional final function that's applied, which is the negate function. And that's applied to the result of the 2 rotate 5, 7 take off. Right? So this is important on how to read the notation. Yeah. Yeah, so if we go up here and shift this to an egg 3, it's going to rotate here. No. Got it. It's just yeah. Got it. The monadic application is negate. Right. Yeah. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> so. <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> yes. So the way you have to parse this is with those extra parentheses around it. So that is probably one of the more, con for, for people used to the overloaded minus in other languages, be aware of this. Because you don't want to type, you can really make yourself upset and angry if you don't internalize the difference between high minus and minus. So pay careful attention to that. So let's do the neg two again, that's what we want. And let's move on to Add a neg one rotate, and can we guess which axis that rotates around? Yeah. So now we've created it with the glider sort of centered in the middle there. I really like the matrix. And then we can give that a name, call it big R. So another feature of the language, we are case sensitive. Thank goodness. And then our literal notation, again, allows us to put three of these R's together like this. Now this is where the space behaves slightly differently. So the space here is not sort of just concatenating these together. These R's are considered single units. And so when they are put together three like this, it's called a strand and it's a box of these. So can we say what would the shape of this be? just a three. So in the representation of this, we can get a slightly more verbose representation here and see the idea. I probably typed it in wrong, but I can't see it. it is interpreting the negative one e to the negative two as 0.01? That's not an e. That's the um, that? control shift seven, where control is your mode shift. That's the different from the epsilon too. Is that just a font thing? Yes, that's different. Epsilon is not a, uh, that's membership, set membership, give or take. You can run that. That's not an ADA, that's a, a tilde? There's no tilde here. Oh, 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 inside of here, yeah. So what we're doing is this more verbose notation is giving us a little bit more information about the shapes of the arrays. So the outer array is a vector because it only has the one arrow on the top, not a matrix. That's a theta, right? Where? Where, where? That one or the one up there? This guy. Ah, up there. That note, that is a circle with a line in the middle. No. Theta is a Greek symbol. No, it's not a phi. It's a circle bar. That's also a particular key. That's not a Greek character. We're going to get there. Oh, we're going to get there. We are going there. 
We're going to get there. We'll, we'll go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason we're doing this walkthrough is to get you guys used to typing these symbols. By the end of the day, this won't be a problem at all. You'll have no problem typing the symbols. I mean, it's a bit of a thing. They're not using the, the graphical ID with the, the Ah, well. Dramatically lowers the... Yes. Yeah, so, okay. So, what, what we could do is we could put our little language bar up here. And we could dock it to the top. And then I could point and click. What? Yeah, so you could do this. But that's the default on the Mac. Yeah, it's the default on Windows, too. Um, and it'll be the default on Linux as well. Yes, if you use Ride on Linux, that'll also be the default. But you have to use the standard installer as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I, I'm going to be... Ex my personal opinion is that I abhor that little language bar. But uh, for newbies, absolutely, if you're used to, you know, the point and click will work fine. If you can try to use the keyboard, I find the experience much better, even though it's difficult at first. So it'll be difficult to find the keys at first. It'll feel like dragging yourself through the mud. However, you'll quickly begin to identify where the keys are. And if you hover over one, yeah, and, exactly. yeah. <laughs> yeah, and hovering over it, we'll, we'll, we'll find you what the keys are. Uh, I, I learned APL on Linux with the terminal version, so I just read the X Windows key map inside of the APL thing. So you don't think anybody else should have it easier? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I learned OpenBSD when I had to still manually edit my XORG config files, so reading a little map like that was no problem. I like this because it gives me more screen real estate, and I like to type, so I find it a lot easier. But yes, feel free to use the language bar if you like. Um, so R is a, two, uh, R is a um, matrix, right? Yeah, so if we were to do this, right, we're going to get a 5 by 7. What we get shape-wise from the RRR is not that, because what we have is three of these put together. Now, if we were to ask ourselves what is the depth, or sorry, the depth of R, we'd get 1. But if we asked what the depth of our R is, it's 2, right? Because we've got a nested vector now. So we have a vector of matrices. So the shape is going to tell us what the shape of the outer array is. Depth is going to tell us how deeply nested that vector is. So the three uh, matrices is actually different in how it's compared to just the rank 3. Yes, so if we wanted a rank 3 array, we could get the shape of the RRR, and we get a rank 3 array, which is three 5 by 7 options. And if we were to print that out, we get something like this, because it's not nested. So there's no boxes here, right? So we could call a rank 3 array a cube, a rank 2 array a matrix, a rank 1 array a vector, a rank 0 array a scalar, and a rank 4 and above a noble array. Rank one, scalar, rank, or sorry, rank zero, scalar, rank one, vector, rank two, matrix, rank three, cube, and rank four and above, noble arrays. Can you say like a noble four, or four noble? You would normally just say a rank n array. And you would use the term noble to refer, refer to the whole group of higher dimensional arrays. I like to think of rank four arrays as time arrays or, or arrays in time and space and things like that. But okay. yes. All right. Sorry, what was triple bar? In the monadic form, that's depth. In the dyadic form, that's equivalence to compare two arrays for structural and value identity. All the way down. Uh, no, are you familiar with Scheme? Uh, do you know equal hook? Okay. That's equiv. Okay. Whereas the equal symbol normally is the same, more, is more like a scalar extension of map equals in Scheme. Yeah. All right. 
Okay. So then we can do the 1, 0, neg 1, rotate each of R, R, R. So try that out. Am I? How do I turn those off? Each, that's on the one character, or the one key. Each is the dialog or APL version of map. However, it operates over arrays instead of lists. And it has a few other differences, but. Yeah. We're, we're eaching over the, box. the left and the right hand side. So each of those R's is rotated by one of those scalars on the left hand side. And if, if we had a, a rank for you instead of the box. That would not work. <laughs> because the shape of the left hand side must agree with the shape on the right hand side. Besides the, the, the text? Uh, or this one. So I can make it into like 527. Oh, the 57? That's with the take. So a 57 take. You use the uh, upper arrow key. The, um, that guy right there. Yeah. 57 yeah. take of, yeah, there you go. Oh. So, in addition to this, rather than doing all of those together, or we can create a scalar on the right hand side. So this boxes R up into a scalar. And if you have a scalar mapped over an array, that scalar is extended to be the shape of the other array and maps over it. So in this case, we will do the exact same thing. Well, as we did before, just without having to type all three R's. If you didn't have the three in the scalars of one, zero, negative one, would that be then a rank error? Right. You have to match up the number. So there would be no rank error with anything I put on the right-hand side, because that one scalar will be extended to whatever shape is on the left-hand side. However, if I had a, something like this, and try to do this, I'm going to get an error because they don't conform. Okay. So now, from here, we can do a 1, 0, neg 1 outer product vertical axis rotate or horizontal axis rotate. So each is your, you can think of that as your mapping function. But now outer product, rather than just doing the mapping is going to do the Cartesian product or the, the for every one, every one. So for every one of these things on the left, it's going to apply this function, um, first axis rotate, on every one of the values on the right hand side. And so can somebody guess the shape of the result here? Cheating a little bit because you have it right there in front of you in the uh, in the walkthrough, but go ahead and. And so on. So remember, always right to left. This is called jot dot first axis rotate. Or these two is a di digraph that forms outer product. So you can read this as the outer product first axis rotate. Yes. So you'll recognize outer product. Well, I'll just run this here. But you guys should all recognize this. In fact, it should give you shivers. <laughs> yes. And that's what our outer product operator is doing. So outer product and each are both higher order functions that take a function and derive a new function that does something different based on the old function, the original input function. And higher order functions like these, such as um, map and the like, they associate to the 
left rather than associating to the right. So we evaluate our expressions right to left. And our functions to figure out what is a, a given function, we go from the left to the right. So our function, we go, right. we've parsed our function, and then whatever to the right of that is what's going to be input to that function. Yeah. So all we're doing here with this rotate is taking each of our, is we're doing nine rotations across R using the pairwise combinations. And we can look at that by using a pair op, uh, the pair function on 1, 0, neg 1, outer product, 1, 0, neg 1. So those are our rotations that we're doing. And actually, the pair function in this case, because it's just scalars, we can just use catenate, which is the comma. And so then we apply this guy here, and we get four 5 by 7 matrices in a 3 by 3 grid. Or wait, that doesn't add up. Nine 5 by 7 matrices in a 3 by 3 grid. That, that, that math works better. You can see why I dislike showing times tables. <laughs> All right. How's that running? Everybody able to duplicate that result? Yay. All right, so now what we can do is we can take this expression and do the, the first axis addition, or the first axis sum. So this is a reduction, and most of you guys should be familiar with the concept of a reduction. In APL, we reduce over axes. So in this case, we take the first axes and we eliminate it by reduction. So the result of this will be a three vector containing each I believe row, yeah, reduced together. No. no, each column. Yeah, each column. Yeah. And then we can do this again along columns and reduce it up, or along the last axis. So these two reduce along different axes, um, and we can play with that. So the result is a singleton. So this is not a 5 by 7 matrix. This is a box containing a 5 by 7 matrix. Hence, notice the different printout, which is important to remember. And that gives us our sums. So what are these sums giving us in the game of life? Sorry? Right, it's the neighbor count including self. And so then we can ask which of the neighbors are equal to three and which of the neighbor counts are equal to four. Now equal here is, has an implicit mapping in it. So the scalar primitives in APL map implicitly over their data elements. So you don't have to use each everywhere. Instead, they map deeply through the structure of the arrays recursively. And so the 3 and the 4 is going to get applied to that singleton, uh, 1 for the 3 and 1 for the 4, and then we're going to get this equal map here. That's different. So if I were to translate this into scheme, this would be a map of equals over the list 3, 4, and the box, or the, 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 the single list of this uh, right-hand argument, whatever it is, thing, which would be the reduction reduce, da, 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 and so forth. But the map there is unnecessary because the equal is a scalar primitive, so it already has that map implicit in its definition. Yeah, so 3 iota 9, epsilon 1, 2, 3, 4, 7. Epsilon is not a scalar, so it returns the shape of its 
uh, and it returns a value that's the same shape as its left-hand argument. And then asks which of the left-hand arguments are members of the right-hand argument. Okay, now, there we go. The game of life asks, what, when do we have a future generation? Well, if it's a three, we always have a next, a next gen. So we put a one there and and it against the Boolean result that we got from the three. For the four, we only have a new neighbor, we only have a new cell there when we had a cell there to start with. So we take our, our original matrix R and and that against the result of four equals our counts. And so then we get the set of future generations that we expect based off of the three and four count. Is everybody able to run that expression? Okay, cool. We can speed this up if you want, or is this? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Rank error, love rank error. Rank error is everywhere. Ah, yes, because you didn't put your each in there. So rotate has to have the each after it. Um, right, right after the rotate, yeah, put each. That guy. Nice. Yeah. Oh. Et voila. Okay. Now, what do we do with this little thing? Well, we really want either of those to happen, so we can use another operator to take each of those, and them together, and then apply the OR reduction over that. This is the inner product instead of the outer product. And we'll get something like this. Some of you may know the operation of the inner product from this function, which is matrix multiplication. We're just, APL provides the, the traversal pattern independent of specific scalar operations on inner product. And so we can then apply inner product using ors and ands instead of pluses and multiplications, and we get some slightly different behaviors, which happens to be quite useful here. Now, we're not using the full power of inner product here because we have vectors and scalars. We're not operating over matrices. We're just doing the vector in a product. So. I need to go back a little bit. I, yeah. I don't understand what the previous step is. This guy here. The one above it. Okay, so everything to the right of the Boolean AND is going to get evaluated. Right? And that's given us the neighbor counts and a Boolean, a, a pair that says the Boolean um, results of comparing three against the neighbor count matrix and four against the neighbor count matrix. So we get two matrices back. One where there's a one in all the places where there was a three neighbor count. And the second in the pair is positive for all of the four neighbor counts. And so the three, four equals gives us that. And then what we do is according to the rules of game of life, the next generation only shows up if there's a three neighbor count or if there was originally a cell there in the previous generation and there's a four neighbor count in this generation. Does that make sense? Or not really? So if we have a neighbor count, we look at the threes and the fours and the, the, game of the, the goal of the game of life is to figure out what the next generation is. And that next generation is going to be a Boolean matrix, and we need to figure out which of them are going to be the ones. So if we look at the neighbor count of that cell, if there's a three for that neighbor count, then yes, there's always going to be a one. Oh, one is being scaled to? To all of them, yes. To so this is a, yes. All right, so and? A box with all ones. Right, uh, well, yeah, is extended to a box with all ones, right. Okay. And R is just the original matrix. That's what I'm here. Yes, right. So that's the same concept as we used here with scalar extension. We turned it into a scalar, and then that scalar gets extended.
to the same shape as everything else on the other side. Yes? Yes, because remember that the 3, 4 equals gives you a pair. R is a 5 by 7 matrix, not a 2 vector. And so those two shapes do not conform. If you wanted to do the 3, 4 against R, you would have to enclose the R or box it and turn it into a scalar, which would then extend out. Okay, so everybody was able to run that. So finally, we have a singleton. We actually want the original matrix out, so we disclose or unbox and get the original matrix out. Et voila, Bob's your uncle. We now have an expression that computes the next generation of the game of life. And we did so in one line. And there are a few interesting properties I would like to point out on this line. Where are the if statements? But there's no if statement, is there? There's no branches. You put if statements to write them, though. No. You can just if use a simd vector instruction or a primitive uh, operation. So in here, and particularly in the syntax, there are no if statements. Did we mention the size of the matrix coming in ever? So this expression will work for any size matrix that we provide it. Are there any loops? No explicit looping constructs are used here either. In fact, are there any complicated control flow statements in this expression at all? It's literally just function composition. So let's make it a function so we can use it multiple times, shall we? Can I have a question? Yes. instead of doing it on the left-hand side. Yeah. So we could have. We could have written this as and or reduce. Right. Okay. That would have given us the same result. However, we're APLers here. And we love that. Dot is inner product, or you might know it as dot product, or something okay. similar to that. However, it's dot product parameterized over any arbitrary functions that you provide it. So we have, like, from going from the right, we yes. do it at the end. So this gives us the two box, and then we do the inner product using an or. No, no. So that, the, the or dot and is a single function derived from the or and the and function. So inner product is what's called a dyadic operator. So it's a higher order function that takes two operands. So we, so if I could find this, then it would be around the end. Right. So the, right, well, so remember that expressions are evaluated right to left, but to get to an expression, you have to have an expression tree consisting of functions. So in order to get the function nodes, we evaluate those um, left to right. And we, so then we get these little guys individual function pieces, and then we apply all those functions right to left. The point of that is to get shape conformance. So when we enclose it here and we work off the singleton, then this thing gives us a singleton by this result. And because it's a singleton or a scalar, now we can do this and take advantage of scalar extension in our scalar primitives, and we don't have to do something like a rank or a map or anything like that. It'll just automatically know how to extend everything in the correct order. And the same thing is happening implicitly when we apply the AND operation. All right. 
So now let's make it a function, shall we? We wrap it in braces. That's our lambda construct. And we're APLers here, so we don't like things like explicit naming of our input variables. So implicitly, there's always a omega, which refers to the right-hand argument of the function. Alpha refers to the left-hand argument of the function. There's our Greek symbols in addition to rho and iota. So rho, iota, alpha, and omega are all proper Greek symbols. Yes. Yes, there is. So if we really, really, really wanted to name the argument, you, no, I'm not going to show you how to do that. That's ugly. It's terrible. Why would I do that? <laughs> yes, yes. So you can bind using that. Uh, so, yeah, no, I'm not going to be that mean. Uh, I want to, but I won't be that mean. So diamond is our statement separator. So we can map omega to R. Now, no points for doing that. Negative points for doing that. Do not do that. I... We'll be talking about that, actually. This is an important point that comes up, and... I want you guys to be thinking and ask these kinds of questions because a lot of people are thinking that when they see this code, and we need to talk about that. We're going to talk about that right after we play with this a little bit. But no, neat, nine. Statement is fine. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, part of this workshop is to try to understand why APLers would scoff at that idea and why everyone else would say, of course, that's what you're supposed to do. So this is a very important question we're going to go over. Um, so, yeah. So let's call this life, and let's run it a few times. Yep. You now know the formula for life. So we can run it, and we can create this, which is the first three generations applied to R. And because I want to speed up to the good bits, I'm going to skip in the walk through the gen stuff. That's creating. A uh, apply multiple generations of R, so you can go through that in your walkthrough. I want to get to the goodies, so we're going to start with RR, which is going to be the 1535 take of the neg 10, neg 20 take of R, and we're going to make a picture of this. And we're going to edit it. All right, so we've made a little picture of that. And I want to, because the whole point of the game of life is to see life working, right? So we're going to make an animation of this. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply a life to it. There we go. We're going to apply a life to a fixed point of RR. But we need to do some things to make sure we know how it works. We're going to discard the result. Life is going to be applied and return the result. Before we do that, we need to update the picture variable. Yeah. With our result. And we're going to insert a delay of an eighth of a second into the expression so that we can see it working, and it should be omega. Clear as mud? Sure. And so then we can see the game of life running. <laughs> so you guys should all be able to do this on your machines as well. So this walkthrough is meant for you to get to this point. But I like to have a little more fun with this. So before we get to that, um, yeah, we got enough time. We're going we're gonna, to, we're, we, this is not good enough, right? This is what we usually reach when we do stuff. But I like to go a little further. So I've built a little something for you guys to have even more fun on this. And before we get to that, you should notice here that even at this point, we're eschewing most of control flow. Right. So notice how we're writing this and how we're doing it. We've reached our fixed point, so the function ends. 
But I want something fancier. So fortunately, we have code defunds. So we load in code defunds, and we can, I happen to have pre-compiled a, a library that we can work with. We'll go through that. So I can initialize the graphics inside of there. And assuming that the whole thing doesn't blow up and crash on me, which it very well could, we can take life and we can derive an imager from that and animate it, uh, let's say a thousand times with some random input. And now we can watch the game of life run in grayscale. And that's running on a GPU? Yes. Now, actually, the display is running on the GPU right now. Um, I did not have the... I didn't have the guts to have you guys live coding CUDA code, even if it's through this nice abstraction. Because uh, I have experienced a lot of people, especially on Linux, hard crashing their machines um, and locking the whole thing up and having to restart everything from scratch and so on and so forth. So I felt that the frustration factor would be better uh, hidden away in that point of view. So instead, we're running the game of life function in the interpreter and then dispatching out to the code defunds compiler to handle the graphics display and getting that data onto the GPU and rendering it. So, so is there control for an ATL? Yes. And no, you shouldn't use it. <laughs> but yes. Well, yes. So there is control flow in APL. There's multiple different kinds. We will discuss that uh, towards the end because, in my opinion, control flow should always be at the end of any discussion, not at the beginning. But we'll get to that too. The, uh, it's almost 12 o'clock. When is lunch? Okay, so how are you guys doing on the expressions? It'd be good if you can get to the point where you run that um, textual version, and then if you're brave, we're going to make sure you can run the, the graphical version as well. But. You can hit a, oh, oh, that, you can just go in there and um, like hit control C or actions run and interrupt. Yeah. Uh, you need to be inside of the REPL. Yeah, so click inside the REPL and then um, run and interrupt. You might have to do a strong interrupt. Yeah, there you go. Yes, there you go, all yeah, set. But how, how, how to do the graph. It? Oh, oh, you run a strong interrupt on it under the actions menu. There you go. So where, where are the instructions to um, hook, load code, uh, code, code defunds? defunds? Yeah. So we're going to walk you through doing that okay. probably after lunch. OK. Yeah. So now we can wind down a little bit. We're going to, uh, I think most, are most of you able to see the, the text picture? Or are you still nixing? Yeah. I do All right. So you've been nixed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will, you'll have figured it out by the end of the day. <laughs> um, anyone else, how are, how are we doing? I am in scarce seconds of getting it working. Excellent, OK. Um, what time should we get back here? Whenever you want. Um, I'm going to go grab some lunch. The rest of us should probably grab some lunch. We're going to need to take a lot of breaks. Um, while you're having lunch, I highly recommend you ponder this. And I want you to ask yourself some questions, right? How do I feel about this code? What do I like, dislike about it? What worries me about writing code like this? And imagine if this was the only code you wrote all day long, and this is the only way you thought about code all day long. How would you feel? Does it worry you? Does it give you happy, good feelings? Etc. Because we're, we need to discuss this, because this is the point where everybody stops doing APL. They get to this. They run through this walkthrough. They say, wow, that's cool. And then they can't get any further. There's this learning wall that people generally encounter in APL saying, how do I go from here to implementing a web server like this? How do I get from here to implementing Stormwind's boating simulations, graphics? How do I make a compiler 
which just happens to be my specialty. Uh, how do I um, how do I run Wall Street with this? How do I you know how do I do bioinfo? How do I you know uh, write my games or any of these other questions? Is how would I use this to make that better? And that question, a lot of people don't find answers for. So we're going to cover that in this workshop and make sure we can solve that problem for you, hopefully. So have people done that for uh, Code comes with its own open source web framework uh, called MyServer, which TriAPL is running on, actually. So, yeah. yes? So I believe that it's possible to write a web server using this, but uh, after mindlessly typing this, I would really like to have a simple exercise that I could implement with only the things I've learned so far. Hopefully that's what you're planning next. That's all we're going to be doing. <laughs> so what we're going to be doing next, this is just to get you the feel, start to finish of how it goes through. This is just the walkthrough, the what's just happened sort of situation. I would not have expected you to come in here and derive this yourself. That would be insane. We're close to that, but we're not that insane. So instead, what we're going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit when we get back about how I want you to be thinking and looking at these issues. We're going to be discussing that, but we're discussing a little bit of the history of APL, the whole point and what makes APL different and how to think about that when you're studying your problems. And then we're going to go hog wild. I have a whole set of problem domains that are in that shared notebook. And you're going to pick whichever one you want. You go through it step by step. There are problems for you to solve. Easy step-by-step -step things, starting from what you've learned here and moving forward. And you'll just use the documentation. You'll use us. We'll go through. As people get stuck, we'll do some more demos. We'll go through things, uh, maybe discuss a little more up here, certain things that you want to do. And we'll go through. So any problem you want to work with, we'll play with it. Um, I recommend you start looking at the domains that we already have in the materials file, because that will let you pick one that we've sort of tailored for your easy absorption. But if you wanted to write your own net hack, we can help you do that if you want. Um, so you know, if you want to play around with something like that, no problem. But after, after you get some more food and you get some more caffeine, um, you'll, we'll come back and we'll have some fun.